This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth on the second channel War on Disinformation. I am still busy reading the book The History of the Inquisition and I will continue today reading so because you know that is the video called the next part of the reading of the uh, History of the Inquisition from Philip van Limborch. But before I go into that book I want to read something else to you. It's only a few pages, so please stay with me. A few weeks ago, I received a package from my brother in Christ, Brett Norman, from the United States of America, sending me eight different books. One of those I am reading at this moment with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, from Inquisition Update, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. You maybe have seen that, and otherwise I can very, very warmly lay that to your heart to have a look at that uh, at, that, uh, at those readings, we already did four, but among these books were, was also a book from Martin Luther's works, and I have this right in front of me, it is called Luther's works, it's about volume 41, Church and Ministry, part 3. Now, um, this book was chosen by uh, Brother Brett Norman to send me this because in the end, from page 257 on, it is about against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil, a writing from Martin Luther of 14, uh, 1545, which I will also read. I will probably read this whole book in the future. But... <clears throat> I like to start books when I read them in the beginning, you know. I start. I like to start from the top. So, <clears throat> I had to read through the first part where Luther deals with On the Councils and the Church, written in 1539 from Martin Luther. The Councils and the Church. I will leave the introduction 
but I will read Luther's uh, works, volume 41, on the councils and the church, the introduction to this chapter by the authors. Because I think this is very interesting, because, you know, we dealt, or we dealt, sorry, we dealt with all the different church councils. In the history of the Inquisition, we started with the Council of Nicaea in 325. We spoke about the ecumenical councils, that, what they were called, yeah, starting in Nicaea, then going on to Constantinople in 381, going to Ephesus in 431, and to Chalcedon in 455. We were speaking about all the different discussions the clergy, the so-called Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, had at all those councils. And I'm going to read these two and a half pages, or three and a half pages introduction from Luther's work to you, because this will give you even more understanding of what these councils were and how Luther, a Protestant, a from the Roman Catholic Church branded heretic, would see these councils. He did extensive writing over these councils, of on these councils. One is in his open letter to the Christian nobility. And that is something that you can find in my playlist Hour of the Truth. Uh, quite in the beginning, uh, when I started that Hour of the Truth broadcast, um, there's a two or three show part where I read the open letter to the Christian nobility from 1520 of Martin Luther. So you can go to that to enhance your knowledge. And you can, of course, listen to what I'm reading right now, the introduction of Luther's work on, um, as we said, it's called On the Councils and the Church, written in 1539, seven years before Luther deceased in 1546. And why he deceased in 1546 and the circumstances, well, that's another thing. That is a subject for another discussion. But I really want to read to you now this, intro this introduction here. So please stay with me before we go to a further reading of the history of the Inquisition. I will otherwise, if you want to skip this, I'll tell you in the video where the reading of the History Inquisition starts, and you can skip this one, but I would not advise you to, because this will really get you a deeper understanding. So without any further ado, I'm going to start reading on the Councils and the Churches from Martin Luther. Luther's On the Council and the Church represents his final judgment concerning the medieval church as well as the first broad foundation for a new doctrine of the church within nascent Lutheranism. Luther presents his critique of papal and conciliar authority in three parts. Part 1 argues that the church, the Roman Catholic Church, cannot be reformed according to the decrees of the councils and the church quote-unquote fathers. Part 2 discusses the historical significance of the Apostolic Council at Jerusalem, of which we can read in Acts 5, chapter 15, and the first four ecumenical councils, Nicaea in 325, Constantinople in 381, Ephesus in 431, and Chalcedon in 455. Luther concludes from his analysis that although councils protect the church from error, they have no authority to create new articles of faith. Part 3 deals with the true marks of the church according to Holy Scripture. Luther's earlier proposal at the Leipzig debate in 1519 that Pope and Council be made subject to the Word of God becomes an elaborate argument for a radically new concept of the church. Experience taught Luther to bury all hopes for any reconciliation with Rome. Did you understand this? Experience taught Luther to bury all hopes for any reconciliation with Rome. A sad lesson climaxing in the conviction that, quote, a free general Christian council, unquote, once his dream was never to become reality. In his open letter to the Christian nobility of 1520, Luther had already called for such a council, but to no avail. Rome would not listen to the German heretic. 
After all, the reform councils of the 15th century, whose aim it was to curb papal authority, did not leave Rome with happy memories. First through the excommunication of Luther in 1521, then through tedious diplomacy, Rome therefore tried to rebuff all attempts to call a council. And yet, pressure from Charles V, the emperor who reigned between 1519 and 1556, the Holy Roman Empire, and the German princes could not be uh, endured forever. After years of negotiations, diplomatic artistry and futile attempts to assemble it earlier, Paul III, who, you know, established the Jesuit order in 1540, who reigned as a pope between 1534 and 1549, finally called a council, which met at 1545 at Trent. The diabolical Council of Trent, where the Counter-Reformation was established. That is the council that Pope Paul III called for after he initiated the military order of the Jesuits in 1540. Luther, who died shortly after the first concilia sessions in Trent, became more and more infuriated by Rome's tactics of delay. Since the Diet of Augsburg in 1530 and the Peace of Nuremberg in 1532, it had become evident that the Protestant cause would not receive a real hearing by Pope and Emperor. Now a little side note for you to study a little bit real history. We are speaking here about the Peace of Nuremberg in 1532 that was a peace uh, negotiated for the Protestant cause with the Roman Catholic Church. Now you maybe have an idea why the Nuremberg trials of the Second World War took place in Nuremberg also. Kind of a payback. Still, the author continues, the adherents of the Augsburg Confession had declared in 1530 their willingness to participate in a, free, uh, in a general free and Christian council. And so, in the mid-1530s, when papal emissaries, among, the Paul, uh, uh, among them Paul Vergerio, who was papal nuncio to Germany at that time, began to appear in Germany to secure Protestant participation in the council. Protestants had to decide whether or not to attend. Members of the small cult league agreed in 1537 to Protestant participation in the council on four conditions. First, it must be a free and not a papal council. Second, Protestants must be invited as full participants, not as heretics. Third, its decisions must be based upon the authority of Holy Scripture and not upon that of the Pope. And four, it must be held in Germany, if at all possible. Rome, of course, never accepted these conditions. Rome never compromises or listens to anyone. Furthermore, the hostilities between Emperor Charles V and Francis I of France between 1515 and 1547 led to one postponement of the Council after another. In June 1536, Pope Paul III issued a call for a Council to meet in Mantua in May. In 1537, in April 1537, he postponed it until November of that same year, then until May 1st, 1539, naming Vicenza as the new meeting place. The prelates did not assemble, however, and finally, on May 21st, 1539, the council was postponed indefinitely because the emperor was at war with France on that date. It was under these circumstances that Luther prepared the small cult articles published in 1538. He began to write on the councils and the church at the same time, what we are reading here. Since 1533 he had planned to deal extensively with the history of the councils and the church. In 1535 he published a small tract on the Council of Constance, which took place in 1415, followed by a Latin edition of three letters of John Huss and several brief statements concerning conciliar authority in general. 
Luther's concern for a clear position with regard to conciliar authority was accomplished by a growing interest in the history of the Church. In 1538 he published his edited versions of the Apostles and Athanasian creeds, the Te Deum and the Nicene Creed, as well as a letter written by Jerome dealing with papal authority. <clears throat> Then he began to work his way through almost all the available sources dealing with the history of the early and medieval church. Most of these sources are used and quoted in the treatise on the council and the church, what I'm going to read later on. They are the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius of Caesarea, covering the period from the apostles to Constantine the Great in 324. Its supplementation and elaboration to the year 395 by Rufinus, entitled The Eleven Books of Ecclesiastical History, the Historia Tripartitia of Cassodes, uh, Cassidorus, Senator, who edited and continued these earlier works until uh, 560 AD, based upon excerpts from Theodoret of Cyrus, Socrates, who we also read in the history of Inquisition about, and Sosaminus of Constantinople, and the collections of the Fathers and Canon Law. In addition, Luther used the new published two-volume work of Peter Krabbe on the councils of Bartholomew Platinas' Lives of, Lives of the Popes, written between 1471 and 1481. This would be a wonderful book to get my hands on. The Lives of the Popes, from Bartolomeo Platina, written between 1471 and 1481. A very, very interesting work, as I have learned already. But I did not check where to get that book yet. While working on the treatise, he became convinced that the flow of reliable historical sources ended at the time of the Fourth Ecumenical Council. For this reason, he treated only the first five centuries. So, there's still a little bit to read <coughs> on this um, page 8 in the introduction before Luther starts his writing, but I will stop this here because this was the important message that I wanted to share with you. And um, I hope that you got the idea why I was reading about these different councils that we, of course, studied in the first readings of History of the Inquisition. You know, it is always interesting to have different kinds of sources uh, and, and combine them when you read something. And uh, I think this is absolutely the Holy Spirit leading that Brett chose this book to send to me. And even though that he chose it for another reason than the one that I've just read to you, um, when I take on me to read the history of the Inquisition and I see the similarities in Luther's writings in 1539 about, uh, on, on the councils and see how they are mentioned in this reading of the history of the Inquisition and then the, to combine it to get us an even deeper and better understanding of the subject. This is really why I love this work and why I'm being led by the Spirit to do this because I could never make all these different connections, but it's the spirit leading into all truth. So, we have done a little introduction of Luther's work, and now we will continue in the book History of the Inquisition, on page 117. And as you remember, last we uh, read this uh, paragraph here, and I will start on the top paragraph on page 117 to get us into the mood to do a further reading. <coughs> but I only want to inform you at this moment that I have not prepared anything of this reading because I was so busy with uh, Tom Fress reading the book Futurism and Preterism and making the videos of that, that I didn't have the time. So please forgive me when here and there probably my reading will uh, stuck a little bit and I will stutter a little bit as you <laughs> already noticed I did before. Except for this very first paragraph that we read last time, I haven't read anything of the things that are going to come right now and that we are reading and discussing. So, but you know, that's then genuine study, right? 
So on the top of one hundred, uh, page 117, the author says, <clears throat> I have thrown all these excellent passages of the sacred writings together, that it may appear in the most convincing light that the scriptures have nothing in them to countenance the spirit or any of the methods of persecution and to confront the melancholy account I have given before of the progress and ravages caused by this accursed evil. Good God, how have the practices of Christians differed from the precepts of Christianity? Would one imagine that the authors of those dreadful mischiefs and confusions were the bishops and ministers of the Christian Church? That they had ever be uh, that they had ever read the records of Christian religion, or if they had, that they ever believed them? And then I told you, let's answer this question, or if they had read them, that they ever believed them, answer this in the next reading, that is today. So maybe you have come up with an answer, I have come up with an answer. If they had read the records of Christian religion, have they ever believed them? Well, we again have to make a very profound distinction between Christians and Catholics. And what we are reading here on the different councils, of course, and all the outcome of all that stuff, is always dealing with Christianity, quote-unquote Christianity, because it is dealing actually with Catholicism. This blue highlighted sentence, Good God, how have the practices of Christians differed from the precepts of Christianity. This sentence should read, Good God, how have the practices of Christians differed from the precepts of Catholicism? Because it's Catholicism that we deal with. Or we should even read it the other way around. Makes even more sense. Good God, how have the practices of Catholics differed from the precepts of Christianity. I think this is even a better way to understand it. The precepts of Christianity were laid by the apostles and laid in the book, the word of God, the Bible. And these quote-unquote Christians, Catholics, don't adhere to the Bible, but their own tradition and their own teachings. Would one imagine that the authors of those dreadful mischiefs and confusions yeah, and all the different councils, all the confusions they laid, where the bishops and ministers of the Christian Church, of the true Christian Church? No, they are ministers of the Roman Catholic Church. That they had ever read the records of Christian religion? No, they don't read the Bible, they even condemn the Bible. And they add to it and they take from it. Or if they had ever read the records of Christian religion, had they believed them? No, they don't believe them because they teach what Satan gives them as quote-unquote knowledge, as quote-unquote wisdom. So I hope I answered that question to your satisfaction. I answered it to my satisfaction. So now let's continue on the second paragraph on page 117. But it may be objected that whatever may be the precepts of Christian religion, yet the conduct even of the apostles themselves gives some countenance to the spirit and practice of persecution, and particularly the conduct of St. Paul, and that such powers are given to the guides and bishops of the Christian Church, as to either expressly or virtually include in them a right to persecute. Let us briefly examine each of these pretensions. As to the practice of the Apostles, Biza mentions two instances to vindicate the punishment of heretics. The first is that of Ananias and Sapphira, struck dead by Peter, and the other that of Elymas, the sorcerer, struck blind by Paul. 
But how impertinently are both these instances alleged? Alleged! Heresy was not the thing punished in either of them. Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead for hypocrisy and lying, and for conspiring, if it were possible, to deceive God. Elymas was a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet, a subtle, mischievous fellow, an enemy to righteousness and virtue, who withstood the apostolic authority and endeavoured by his frauds to prevent the conversion of the deputy of the Christian faith. The two first of these persons were punished with death. By whom? What? By Peter? No. By the immediate hand of God. Peter gave them a reproof suitable to their wickedness. But as to the punishment, he was only the mouth of God in declaring it, even of that God who knew the hypocrisy of their hearts, and gave his signal instance his abhorrence of it to the infancy of, Christ, uh, of the Christian Church, greatly to discourage, and if possible for the future, to prevent men's thus dealing fraudulently and insincerely with God. And, I presume, if God hath a right to punish frauds and cheats in another world, he hath a right to do it, to do so in this world, especially in the instance before us which seems to have something very peculiar in it. Peter expressly says to Sapphira, and we can read that in Acts 5 verse 9, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? You know, Sapphira and his woman who came there, telling them that they did sell the house for another price. You remember that one? That's how I remember it, I didn't read it, but otherwise we can just go into Acts 5 verse 9 for a second, and we can look that up. Acts 5 verse 9, <clears throat> I think that is where they stri we struck down. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that, we have, that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So when we go back to chapter uh, chapter 5 of Acts, you know that uh, is a, a certain man called Ananias, whoever we are speaking about, and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, <coughs> meaning they were cheating on the body of Christ. So you, you can read that for yourself. I'm not going into reading of the whole uh, Acts uh, chapter 5 now, but you get the idea. This is what we are talking about. Does this have anything to do with persecution? Does this have anything to do with inquisition that Peter kills him? Peter doesn't even do that. Peter expressly says to Sapphira, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? What can this tempting of the Spirit of the Lord be but an agreement between Ananias and his wife to put this fraud on the Apostle to see whether or, uh, whether, no, whether or not he could discover it by the Spirit he pretended to? This was a proper challenge to the Spirit of God, which the Apostles were endued with, and a combination to put the apostolic character to the trial. Had not the cheat been discovered, the cheat from uh, Ananias and his wife Sapphira, had not the cheat been discovered, the Apostle's inspiration and mission would have been deservedly questioned. And as the state of Christianity required that this divine mission should be abundantly established, Peter lets them know that their hypocrisy was discovered and to create the greater regard and attention to, uh, to their persons and message, God saw fit to punish that hypocrisy with death. God saw fit to punish that hypocrisy with death, not men. It was the power of God that struck uh, Ananias and his wife Sapphira for the deception of the Holy Spirit at the time. 
Now, as to Elimus uh, the sorcerer, this instance is a uh, is a foreign and impertinent. Sorry, this instance is as foreign and impertinent as the other. Sergius Paulus, proconsul of Cyprus, had entertained that Paphos uh, at at Paphos one Bar Jesus, a Jew, a sorcerer. Yeah, this Bar Jesus, I think, is even going to um, Simon the sorcerer, right? Um, you know this uh, in, in in Acts, uh, it's um, Simon Magus against uh, Simon Peter, and Simon Magus is called, I think, Bar Jesus. So if I'm not mistaken, that's that's him. Uh, Pro Council of Cyprus had entertained at Paphos one Bar Jesus, a Jew, who he was, a sorcerer, who he was. We can read that in Acts. He wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit, and he is actually the founder of the Roman Catholic cult. And we will see that in another reading when it goes against uh, when it goes on um, uh, Simon Magus versus Simon the so uh, Simon Magus versus Simon Peter. Um, I'm going to read that. And another time. So, continue uh, reading the whole sentence here. Sergius Paulus, proconsul of Cyrus, had entertained at Paphos one Bar Jesus, a Jew, a sorcerer, and hearing also that Paul and Barnabas were in the city, he sent for them to hear the doctrine they preached. Accordingly, they endeavored to instruct the deputy in the Christian faith, but were without, uh, but uh, were withstood by uh, Elymas, who, by his subtleties and tricks, endeavoured to hinder his conversion. St. Paul, therefore, in order to confirm his own divine mission and to prevent the deputies being deceived by the frauds and sorceries of Elymas, after severely rebuking him for his sin and opposition to Christianity, tells him not that the proconsul ought to put him in jail and punish him with the civil sword, but that God himself would decide the controversy. By striking the sorcerer himself immediately by a blind, which, ac uh, which accordingly came to pass to the full conviction of the proconsul. Uh, and we can read this in Acts chapter 8, verses 6 and following, as you can see on the side note of the book here. And that deals with Simon the sorcerer. Now, what is there in all this to vindicate persecution? God punishes wicked men for fraud and sorcery, who knew their hearts and had a right to punish the iniquity of them. Therefore, men may punish others for opinions they think to be true and are conscientious in embracing without knowing the heart or being capable of discovering any insincerity in it. Or God may vindicate the character and mission of his own messengers when wickedly opposed and denied by immediate judgments inflicted by himself on their opposers. Therefore, the magistrate may punish and put to death without any warrant from God such who believe their mission and are ready to submit to it as far as they understand the nature and design of it. Are these consequences just and rational? Or would any man have brought these instances as precedents for persecution that was not resolved at all hazards to defend and practice it? But doth not St. Paul command to deliver persons to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, as we can read in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 5? deliver persons to Satan for the destruction of the flesh? Yes, very important, very important part of the Bible. And I was reading um, in, um, in my Bible study uh, the other week, uh, you know, uh, I have with Brett Norman and Tom Fress, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you see here 6 is a little bit in color because that's the last one we did, but we read before that chapter 5. And um, that was absolutely an, uh, an interesting thing to say, because it was said here to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved, may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
what are we reading here? Well, you can read 1 Corinthians 5 for yourself. I'm not going to do a whole Bible study here with you. But the point is that it started out when it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So the one who was fornicating within the congregation of the Corinthians was spoken about here in verse 5, to deliver such an one, the fornicator, unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Meaning, we are not taking the sword in our hands to destruct the flesh, to the destruction of the flesh, meaning to kill that person for his fornication. We deliver him up to Satan. How do we do that? For example, by banishing him from our congregation, throwing him out and leave it to Satan to destruct his flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, because we don't know his heart, but Jesus does. It is not on us to take a capital punishment on those people. We can leave the destruction of the flesh to Satan and Jesus will deal with with the spirit in the time of the judgment because maybe his spirit be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus meaning when Jesus comes for the judgment how is that possible because only Jesus knows the heart of men we don't know the heart of men we can judge their deeds but we cannot judge the people we can judge the Catholics for their deeds, their satanic deeds, but we cannot judge the people. Because they often think that they are doing God's work. Because they are betrayed. That's why we have to love the people. And we have to deliver anyone for the destruction of the flesh to Satan, to this system. Not do it ourselves. And let God deal with the rest. Let Jesus deal with the rest when he comes back for his judgment. This is what this part is all about. I am very glad that only a fortnight ago I studied Corinthians chapter 5. It's fresh in my mind. So that when I read here the history of the Inquisition and we read about 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5 that deliver persons to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. How is that best to be understood? But doth not St. Paul command to deliver persons to Satan for the destruction of the flesh? Doth he not wish that they were even cut off who trouble Christians and enjoin us to make them which cause divisions and offense contrary to his doctrine and to avoid them and not to eat with them? Undoubtedly he does. But what can be reasonably in, uh, in, in, uh, insert, what can be reasonably inferred from hence in favor of persecution, merely for the sake of opinions and principles? In all these instances that we've just spoken about, the things censured are immoralities and vices. The person who was delivered by St. Paul to Satan was guilty of a crime not so much as named by the Gentiles themselves, the incestuous marriage of his father's wife. And the persons we are, as Christians, commanded not to keep company and eat with are men of scandalous lives, such as fornicators, or coveters, or idolaters, or railers, or drunkards, or extortioners, making a, procession, a profession of the Christian religion, or, in St. Paul's phrase, called brethren, a wife and prudent exhortation in those, a wise and prudent exhortation in those days, especially to prevent others from being corrupted by such examples and any infamy thrown on the Christian name and character. As to, as to those whom the apostles wishes, whom the apostle wishes cut off, they were persecuting Jews. Who, pre, who spread contention amongst Christians and 
taught them to bite and devour one another, upon account of circumcision and such like trifles. Men that were the plagues and corruptors of the society they belonged to. Men who caused such divisions, and who caused them out of a love to their own belly, deserve to have a mark set upon them, and to be avoided by all who regarded their own interest or the peace of others. Like I said, banish them from your congregation. Leave the destruction of the flesh to Satan and the judgment of the soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. What the Apostle means by delivering to Satan, I am not able certainly to determine. Well, I just told you what that is. It was not, I am sure, the putting the person in jail or torturing his body by an executioner, nor sending him to the devil by the sword or the faggot. Absolutely agreed, I told you what that was. But anyway, let's continue the author, try to explain how he understands it. One thing included in it undoubtedly was his separation from the Christian church. Like I said, banishment. Put away from amongst yourselves that wicked person which probably was attended with some bodily distemper, distemper, which, as it came from God, had a tendency to bring the person to consideration and reflection. The immediate design of it was the destruction of the flesh to cure him of his incest, that, by repentance and reformation, his spirit might be saved in the day of Christ, and the power by which the apostle afflicted, inflicted this punishment was peculiar to himself, which God gave him for edification and not for destruction. So that whatever is precisely meant by delivering to Satan, is, uh, it was the punishment of a notorious sin, a punishment that carried the marks of God's hand and was designed for the person's good, and was actually instrumental to recover and save him as we can read in 2 Corinthians 2. But what resemblance is there in all this to persecution, in which there is no appearance of the hand of God, nor any marks of those of the cruelty and vengeance of men, no immorality punished, and, generally speaking, nothing in its nature deserves punishment, or, or but what deserves encouragement and applause. And it is very probable this is what St. Paul means by his wishing those uh, means by uh, wishing those cut off who disturb the peace of the Galatian Christians, by spreading divisions among them and exciting persecutions against them. Though, I confess, if St. Paul meant more and prayed to God that those obstinate and incorrigible enemies to Christianity who, for private views of worldly interest, raised perpetual disturbances and persecutions wherever they came, might receive the just punishment of their sins. And who is the punisher, the just punisher of the sins of men? Only God and not men, right? And be hereby prevented from doing farther mischief, I don't see how this could have been inconsistent with charity or his own character as an inspired apostle. And I agree with the author here. We are not to lay hands upon the sinners. We are to call them out for what they are. We are to judge them on their sins. But we are not to execute any judgment, and surely not a carnal judgment with one, with a sword or whatever, but banish them from our congregation, and leave the destruction of the flesh to Satan and the judgment of the soul to Jesus Christ on the day that he returns. It may possibly be urged, the author continues, that though the things censured in these places and immoralities are immoralities, sorry, again, it may possibly be urged that though the things censured in these places are immoralities, yet that there are other passages 
which refer only to principles, and that the Apostle Paul speaks against them with great severity. In Galatians 1 and Titus 3, there are two quotes that come up right now. As particularly, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And from Titus, and again, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. As to the first of these, nothing can be more evident than that the Apostle pronounces an anathema only against those who subverted the Christian religion, such who taught that it was insufficient to salvation without circumcision and submission to the Jewish law. As the gospel, as the gospel he taught was what as the gospel he taught was what he had received from Christ. He had, as an apostle, a right to warn the churches. He wrote to against corrupting the simplicity of it, and to pronounce an anathema, meaning to declare in the name of his great master, Jesus Christ, that all such false teachers should be condemned who continue to do so, meaning who did not repent. And this is the utmost that can be made of the expression. And therefore this place is as impertinently alleged in favor of persecution as it would be to allege those words of Christ, quote, He that believeth not shall be condemned. The anathema pronounced was the divine vengeance, it was anathema maranatha, to take place only when the Lord should come to judgment, and not to be executed by human vengeance. Now, do you understand the importance of this sentence? To take place only when the Lord should come to judgment, and he hasn't come even yet in 2017, and he will not come for several years, I'm quite sure, and not to be executed by human vengeance. Because that's what's it. It's human vengeance when we take the sword in our, uh, our hand ourselves. And what does the Bible say? Our Father says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Not mine, the man's, Yorks or whoever, persons. It is not on us to vengeance. We are to take the tribulations and humilities and persecutions and God will revenge us. To take place only when the Lord should come to judgment and not to be executed by human vengeance. As to heresy, against with such dreadful outcries have been raised, tis taken indifferently in a good or a bad sense in the scripture. In the bad sense, it signifies not an involuntary error <coughs> or mistake of judgment into which serious and honest minds may fall after a careful inquiry into the will of God, but a willful criminal corruption of the truth for worldly ends and purposes. Thus, this reckoned by St. Paul himself, amongst the works of the, uh, of the flesh, such as adultery, uh, the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, variance, strifes, and the like, because heresy is embraced for the sake of fleshly lusts, and always ministers to the serving them. Now from Second Peter 2, as you can see here on the, on the side, we read the next coming Bible quotes. Thus, St. Peter, there were false prophets also amongst the people, even as there shall be false teachers amongst you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoke of. And, and through covetousness 
shall they, with feigned words, make merchandise of you. Whom the Father describes as walking after the flesh in the lust of the uncleanness, and as given to almost all manners of vices. This is heresy, and denying the Lord that bought us, that is, by the way, the spirit of Antichrist. And the only meaning of the expression, as used by the Apostle, thought it hath been applied by weak or designing men, to denote all such as don't believe their metaphysical notion of the Trinity or the Athanasian Creed. Hence, it is that St. Paul gives it, as the general character of an heretic, that he is subverted, meaning from the Christian face, sinneth, by voluntarily embracing errors, subversive of the gospel in favor of his, of his lusts, on which account he is self-condemned, meaning by his own conscience, both in the principles he teaches and the wild uses to which he makes them serve, so that so so that uh, those sincere and honest inquirers have after truth persons who who fear God and practice righteousness may be heretics in the esteem of men for not understanding and believing their peculiarities in religion, yet they are not and cannot be heretics according to the scripture this, uh, according to the scripture description of heresy and the notion of which there is always supposed a wicked heart causing men willfully to embrace and propagate such principles are subversive of the gospel in order to serve the purposes of their avarice ambition and lust such heresy as this is unquestionably one of the worst of crimes and heretics of this kind are worthy to be rejected. They are worthy to be rejected, not to be killed with the sword. You hear that, you persecuting Catholics who think you are of the Church of God of the Bible? It must be confessed that heresy hath been generally taken in another sense, and to mean opinions that differ from the established orthodoxy, meaning Catholic opinion, or from the creeds of the clergy that are uppermost in power, who have not only taken on them to reject such as have differed from them, from their communion and church, but to deprive them of fortune, liberty and life. Deprive them of fortune, liberty and life. To take away from them everything they have to sustain their life. That's what the Roman Catholic Church does with people that they call heretics. That's exactly what they do. They take all your possessions, all your money, they take your freedom and even your life. That is the Inquisition that we are learning about in this whole book. And we have just learned that that is not Christian, that that is not what God ordains to do. But as St. Paul's notion of heresy entirely differs from what the clergy have generally taught about it, theirs may be allowed to be a very irrational and absurd doctrine, and the apostles remain a very wise and good one. And though they have gone into all the lengths of wickedness to punish what they have stigmatized with the name of heresy, they have had no apostolic example or precept to countenance them. Scripture heretics being only to be rejected from the church, according to St. Paul, and as to any farther punishment, tis, deser uh, tis deferred till the Lord shall come. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. As to the powers given to the guides, or overseers, or bishops of the church, I allow their claims have been exceeding great. They have assumed to themselves the name of church and clergy, hereby to distinguish themselves from the flock of Christ, where Christ taught that we are all the same and there is no hierarchy within us. We are all brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, but they assume the name of church and clergy for themselves. Yeah? 
hereby to distinguish themselves from the flock of Christ, from the other brethren. They have taken on them, as we have seen, to determine, mend and alter the faith, to make creeds for others, not for themselves, for, to make creeds for others, and oblige them to subscribe them and to act as though our Saviour had divested himself of his own rights and given unto them all power in heaven and earth. But these claims have as little foundation in the gospel as in reason. The words clergy and church are never once used in scripture to denote the bishops or other officers, but the Christian people. St. Peter advises the presbyters to feed the flock of God and to exercise the episcopal office willingly, not as lording it over the heritages or clergy of God. And St. Paul, writing to his Ephesians and speaking of their privileges as Christians, says that by Christ they were, that by Christ they were made God's peculiar lot or heritage or clergy. In like manner, the body of Christians in general and particularly congregations in particular places are called the church, but the ministers of the gospel never in contradiction to them. It is of all believers that St. Peter gives that notable description, that they are a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices, not a piece of bread and a, a, a wafer and a monstrance, as chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation and a peculiar people, or a people for his peculiar heritage or purchased possession, as the word is rendered in Ephesians 1 verse 14. So that to be the church the clergy and the sacred priest of God is an honor common to all Christians in general by the Gospel Charter. These are not the titles of a few only who love to exalt themselves above them. Undoubtedly the order of the Christian worship requires that there should be proper persons to guide and regulate the affairs of it. And according to, uh, accordingly, St. Paul tells us that Christ gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Ephesians chapter 4. Different offices according to the different state and condition of his church. To the apostles, extraordinary powers were given to fit them for the service to which they were called. And to enable them to manage these powers in a right manner, they were under the peculiar conduct of the Spirit of God. Thus, our Saviour, after his resurrection, breathed on his disciples the Holy Ghost, or breathed. Thus, our Saviour, after his resurrection, breathed on his disciples the Holy Ghost, as the Father breathed in the man the soul, and said, Whosoever sins ye remit, ye are remitted to them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. A commission of the same import with that which he gave them before in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. To bind is to retain men's sin, and to lose is to remit their sin. And this power the apostles had, this power the apostles had, and it was absolutely necessary, they should have it, or they could never have spread his religion in the world. But wherein did this binding and loosing, this retaining and remitting of sins consist? What in their saying to this man, I absolve you from your sins, and to the other I put you under the sentence of damnation, 
would any considerate man in the world have ever credited their pretensions to such an extravagant power? Or can one single instance be produced of the apostles pretending to exercise it? No. Their power of binding and losing, of retaining and remitting sins, consisted in this, and in this principally, meaning their fixing the great conditions of men's, <coughs> of men's future salvation and denouncing the wrath of Almighty God against all who, through, will, through willfully obstinacy, obstinacy, would not believe and obey the gospel. And the commission was given them in the most general terms, whose so ever since ye retain, etc., not because they were to go to particular persons and uh, and peremptorily say, Thou shall be saved and thou shall be damned, but because they were to preach the gospel to Gentiles as well as Jews and to fix those conditions of future happiness and misery that should conclude all the nations of the earth to whom the gospel should be preached. This was their proper office and work, as apostles, and in order to this they had the Spirit given them to bring all things that Christ had said to their remembrance, and to instruct them fully in the nature of doct and doctrines of the gospel. And as they have declared the whole counsel of God to the world, they have loosed and bound all mankind, even the very bishops and pastors of the church, as well as others. As they have fixed those conditions of pardon and mercy, of future happiness and misery for all men, from which God will not recede to the end of time. This was a power fit to be entrusted with men under the conduct of an unerring spirit. The conduct of an unerring spirit, the Holy Spirit, and with them only, whereas the common notion of sacerdotal or priestly absolution, as it hath no foundation in this commission to the apostles, nor in any passage of the sacred writings, is irrational and absurd and which the priests have no more power to give than any other common Christian whatsoever. No, nor than they have to make a new gospel. And that's actually what they do. A new gospel. Now, we have come already to an hour of the reading here. And um, I will mark this here and he will, we will continue in the next reading on the bottom of page 122. I hope you enjoyed it, you learned a little bit, and uh, certainly that you maybe look up Luther's works and have a look at that. I'm not Lutheran. I don't belong to any congregation, and you know that by now, I think. But uh, when somebody speaks the truth, especially as Luther did in that time, it has to be said and studied. Luther made mistakes, everyone makes mistakes, I make mistakes, you make mistakes. Nobody can say from himself that he is perfect. And if he does, he doesn't have the right spirit in him, that's sure. Anyway, it was an interesting reading of this, and especially the little excursion into uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I found very interesting to make this point that we should leave the destruction of a fornicator, the destruction of the flesh to Satan, that Jesus Christ, when he comes back, shall judge the soul. And it is not on us to take the sword in our own hand. With this, I'm going to leave you for your thoughts and reflections until the next time, and welcome you then to the next reading of the History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborch on Juggler 66 channel War on Disinformation. Thank you very much for watching, listening and commenting, and until next time, God bless you and bye-bye.